So in this video, we're going to have a think about another aspect of how you might want to design a plasmid uh, if you're trying to express a protein. Uh, and today we're going to be thinking about protein tags. OK, so there are other videos that kind of go through the cloning process in, the, uh, in a bit more detail. But let's just remind ourselves of the basics. So what we usually have uh, is some sort of vector. Uh, so we've got an origin of replication. We've got a marker gene. Um, and then we'd have some sort of multiple cloning site. There's a whole other video about multiple cloning sites. So that's a bunch of restriction sites next to each other. We'd usually have a promoter in there to drive the expression uh, of a gene of interest. Um, and then we get our gene of interest. We amplify it by PCR. And we put it into our plasmid by the multiple cloning site. Mm -hmm. So that's great if you just want to express your protein as it is. But sometimes what we want to do is to modify that protein. So we're actually changing the sequence of the protein, therefore changing its structure and therefore its function. Uh, so in order that it will do something slightly different uh, in, our, in our system. So let's just have a look at this construct in a little bit more detail. OK, so what we usually have is there's the promoter and that came from the plasmid originally. Uh, then we've got our gene of interest which we amplified by PCR. Okay. And in order for that to be translated, for it to be expressed, it needs to have at the beginning, it needs to have an ATG at the start. So that's the start codon for translation, encodes methionine. So we need to have an ATG at the end. And then we need to have a stop codon at the end. Uh, and that's where the ribosome dissociates. Okay, So that's what we usually have. As so we have our promoter, which is the transcriptional regulatory switch, and then within the gene of interest, we make sure that we've got an ATG and a stop codon. Now, if we want to add a protein tag, what we need to do is to add uh, amino acids between the ATG and the stop. If we want it to be in the protein, it has to be within this region between the ATG and the stop, because that's the region that's translated. And you can add a tag at either end of your protein. So you could set up a system like this. So there's your promoter. Here's your gene of interest. You've got your ATG as you'd expect. But at the end of it, we add a tag sequence. OK, so we can put that tag sequence on at the end. And in this case, what we need to have is the stop codon comes at the end of the tag. OK, so then that becomes the units that's translated. So we actually need to remove the stop codon that occurs naturally at the end of the gene. We're artificially extending the gene, we're putting a little bit more sequence on it, and the stop codon is going to be there. Okay, So that would be uh, an example of a C-terminal tag. Okay, So C-terminus is at the end of the protein. We could also have a design that looks like this. So we've got our uh, promoter. Uh, and in this case, we put in the tag at the end terminus. So at the start of the protein. So in this case, the ATG needs to be at the start of the tag sequence. Then we've got our gene of interest. And we have our stop codon. Oh, sorry, we do have a stop codon. We do have a stop codon at the end of the protein. Okay. Uh, Let's just remind ourselves there. So here we've got the ATG, then we've got the tag, then we've got the gene of interest, and then we've got stop codon at the end of it. OK, so we are changing uh, the sequence of the protein. Uh, and we're going to add some amino acids and this could be quite small. Um, so we could have, you know, six amino acids. Or we could have an entire extra protein in as our tag. And let's have a look at a couple of examples in there. So some, some tags are very, very small uh, and sometimes some tags are really quite big. So there's three main reasons that you might want to introduce a tag into your protein. So the first 
arm is to do with either stability or solubility. Okay, so it might be that particularly if you're trying to express a prokaryotic protein in a eukaryote or vice versa, it might be that the protein doesn't fold particularly well um, so or uh, isn't very soluble or if you're making it at very high levels then maybe the cell detects that there's too much of this protein it's trying to destroy it. Okay, So there are some tags that we can add to improve uh, stability and solubility. So for example, uh, there's a tag called GST. Uh, which is glutathione S transferase. Uh, that's quite a big tag. That's a whole protein. Okay, uh, and what that does uh, is it stops uh, degradation by the proteasome in eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells have this big complex called the proteasome that's there to degrade foreign proteins or proteins that don't seem to be folded quite right. Um, and if you add GST to your protein, uh, it can uh, stabilise it in the presence of the proteasome. It makes it less likely that the proteasome would cut it off. So particularly if you've got a prokaryotic protein, you're trying to make in eukaryotic cells at quite a high level, you might want to put GST in to improve the stability. You can also have uh, MBP, which is maltose binding protein. Um, so what you do, uh, what that does is that improves uh, the solubility of uh, eukaryotic proteins expressed in a prokaryote. So if you're taking a human gene or a plant gene and you're trying to express that in a bacterium, you might want to add something like maltose binding protein to it um, so that it improves the solubility. So what you end up with these, um, as I say, both of these are quite large tags. So what you end up with is a protein uh, that, so there's your protein of interest, so POI, and then that ends up being tagged. So you've got a whole other protein uh, so I'll put maltose binding protein on there. And that's what we refer to as a fusion protein. Okay, so you've got uh, your protein of interest and the maltose binding protein, which would usually be two separate proteins, but we design it so that they're expressed all as one. So in our uh, genome sequence, what we'd have is this. So we've got the promoter. We'd then have a sequence of our gene of interest we'd have the sequence of maltose binding protein exactly back to back with each other. There's the ATG at the start of our protein of interest. We remove the stop codon at the end of the gene of interest, but we do put a stop codon at the end of the maltose binding protein. So the ribosome will read through the entirety of that, so it will translate the gene of interest, and then it will keep going and translate the maltose binding proteins as well. And there we get a fusion protein. So those two proteins are physically linked to each other. Okay. Second reason that we might want to add a tag um, is to add what's known as affinity tag, uh, which helps us with purification. Okay, so the way that we this works is this. So let's imagine you've been growing up your your cells. Okay, I'll just show them in a flask. Okay, uh, and then when you've grown up enough cells, what you do is to extract the proteins, and you'll get a whole bunch of proteins extracted at that time. So I'm just going to show them as different colors. So we've got some black ones, some blue ones, uh, and some pink ones. Okay, let's say it's the pink protein that we're trying to uh, work with. That's what we actually want to happen. So what we usually do um, is with our sort of raw protein extract is we then usually run that through an affinity column. So affinity columns work like this. Okay, so there's my column. Um, so the proteins are going to go in the top of here. Okay, and they're going to run through the column. But the edges of the column are effectively just sticky, okay? So they might have uh, particular metals associated with it, they might have antibodies, they've got something that is able to bind to your protein of interest, okay? Um, so when you run your proteins through the column, 
your proteins of interest, in this case the pink proteins, will stick to the column and your other proteins will go through just as waste. Okay, so your proteins stick to the column because they've got high affinity and then uh, you uh, do what we call elution off the column. So I'll just draw that again. So elution, so there's the hover there, is where you get some sort of uh, competitive uh, protein that actually has a higher affinity for the column than your protein does. Uh, so we put in um, a competitive uh, protein or molecule. So now that binds to the column instead, forcing your protein off the column. So now you've got your purified extract. So this process relies on there being something in the column that will stick to your protein quite well. And if you're trying to express a new protein that's never been done before, it's unlikely that there will be good columns with good antibodies that can bind to the natural protein. So what we do um, is to modify the protein slightly and add a, an affinity tag that makes it more likely that it will stick to a resin. So for example, the most commonly used one uh, is a hist tag, uh, which literally is six histidine residues. Um, and they bind really well uh, if you've got a column that's based on nickel. Okay, so if you have a column that's based with nickel, having these histidine residues, so you just add an extra six histidines to the end of your protein, um, so you can do that at the end terminus or the C terminus, then if you run it through a column based on nickel, then you'll be able to purify your protein much, much more easily. So hist tags are good examples there, and actually maltose binding protein can also add as an affinity tag, there's flag tags, there's all sorts of different affinity tags that you can use, but they all work on the basis Oh, so here's my protein, and in this case, it's just quite a little tag. So it's just six uh, extra histidines on the uh, outside of my protein of interest. But because I've got the hist tag, it means that it'll bind to the column, so it's easier to purify out. Okay. The last reason that you might want to add a tag uh, is if you're interested in localization. So this tends to be more in the research phase than in the sort of industrial production phase. But if you're working with a multicellular system, so if you're trying to make a transgenic plant, for example, it might be quite important to work out where that protein um, is expressed. And you might want to know which cell types are in, it's in, or you might even want to know which organelle it's expressed in. So this works very similarly to the example over here. So we've got uh, our promoter, We've got our gene of interest. And in this case, the most commonly used localization tag is green fluorescent protein. Okay, so GFP. Again, uh, we'd have the ATG at the start. We've got the stop at the end of the GFP sequence. So we have to remove the, G, the stop codon at the end of our gene of interest. And that will give me another fusion protein. So there's my protein of interest. And that's going to be physically linked to GFP, which has actually got this quite distinctive uh, barrel structure. So now that's a fluorescent protein. Um, so if I uh, take that to a fluorescence microscope, um, or maybe I might want to quantify it on a plate reader that has fluorescence capabilities, for example, then I can tell something about where that protein is. Okay, And again, uh, you should notice that that is another fusion protein. So it's exactly the same as up here. Gene of interest, remove the stop code on, immediately put your tag on, in this case it's GFP, to make a fusion protein that's all made in one thing. So, how do you add uh, these tags into your protein? Okay. First method is you could uh, add via PCR primers. 
and this works for short tags so a hiss tag you could do like this okay so if we think about our pcr primer um then what we'd have five prime end uh, i'm just gonna put x's uh, for any uh, restriction sites or leader sequences that you might want to add. And there's another, there's other videos about that. We then put in an ATG, uh, which is the start codon. We then put in the sequence for our histidine. So uh, the codon CAT uh, encodes histidine. So we do one, two, three, four, Five. So what's six times histidine codons? And then you'd have the sequence of your gene of interest. So I'll just do that as Y, 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 Y. And that's the gene of interest. Uh, so that was uh, leaders uh, and restriction sites. OK, so this is getting to be quite a long primer. This is about the longest that primer can get um, in terms of uh, the number of bases. Uh, but we've put in, so there's the sequence of the gene of interest. Uh, it would need to be a bit longer. You'd have uh, 15 to 20 base pairs there. You've got your six histidine codons, so CAT, 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 CAT. You've got your ATG start codon, so it can be translated. And then you've got whatever restriction sites you need to put it in your vector. So it's quite a long primer, so you can only do that for quite short tags. The other thing is that you can clone into a vector with the tag. And this is actually much more uh, how people usually do it. Um, and certainly for the big tags, so something like maltose binding protein or GFP, you can't put that in via the PCR primer. You have to use a vector that's already got the tag in there. So in this case, our vector So we've got the ORI. I won't draw the selectable marker gene. So we've got the promoter. We've got a multiple cloning site. And then in the vector would be the tag sequence with the stop at the end. Okay. So when you do your cloning and you open that and get your gene of interest in. Okay. So the promoter came from here. Okay. Um, and the tag was in the vector to start with, with that stop code on. Okay, but now we can put in our gene of interest. So that gets cloned in as it would have done before. Okay, so that's the GOI. Okay, so with the GOI, the ATG is at the start of that sequence, but we have to remove the stop code on from the GOI sequence. So when you're uh, designing your reverse primer, so the primer at the end of the gene, what you need to do is to introduce a mutation into it uh, so that um, the there isn't a stop code on at the end because we need the stop code on to be at the end of the tag. OK, so multiple different reasons you might want to add a tag and there are more tags than these. I've just given you a couple of examples. If it's going to work, your tag has to be added between the ATG and the stop. OK, it won't work if the tag is after the stop code on, for example. OK, so it needs to come in before the stop code on. You can add it at the end of the protein, which is called C-terminal tagging. You can add it at the beginning, which is N-terminal tagging. You can either do it via PCR primers if it's quite a short tag, or more usually what you do is you find a vector that already has the tag you want in, and there's kind of public libraries of, um, of vectors. You can sort of just order them from a repository. You find the right vector for you, so it's got the right promoter and the right tag in it. Then you clone into the vector, uh, and if you remove that stop code on, then you've got your tag sequence automatically in there and that will make either a protein with a little tag on the side or it will make one of these fusion proteins.